Including that. Never mind, I'll do it then. Okay, very pleased to see you all. As uh, Alex has said, that uh, I have done a number of talks here because Alex has been very persuasive. And uh, the series is generally called What's Psychology Ever Done for Us? Uh, and that's something that interests me because I'm a psychologist. I'm a clinical and health psychologist. I've worked for the health service for something like 35 years. And I've now retired from the health service, so I'm no longer practicing as a psychologist. But psychology always interested me more than just being a field of study or being a job. It was something that seemed to me to be telling us something about life and the uh, universe and everything. And so uh, that's one of the reasons why I was very pleased to do these talks, because I think sharing that in a way which makes it accessible to other people is really quite useful and important. Just give me a second. I'm just going to change this again and see if I can... Get this working the way it should. I used to think that technology was easy and people were very difficult. I'm beginning to think of the other way around tonight, really, but uh, we'll see how it goes. Okay, so tonight's talk is about happiness. Uh, and I'll say a little bit more about what happiness is and isn't as I go along. Uh, I'd also say that I'm not all that keen on the term happiness for a number of reasons, and I share that uh, with one of the people I'm going to be talking about tonight, Mark Seligman, some of you may have heard of. Uh, and principally, the, the first part of this talk is going to be about some of his theories uh, around what he calls PERMA, positive emotion, engagement, relationships, meaning, and accomplishments. Now, originally what I'd set out to do was just to give that talk tonight, but Alex said, well, we've only got one speaker. Uh, and so rather than try and extend my talk to take up two hours, what I've done is to do something a little bit different tonight. So what we're going to do, well, first of all, that's just the series of talks that I actually have given. And the very first one was in Happiness five and a half years ago. So this is a kind of follow-up to that. But what are we doing tonight? Well, I'm going to talk about what is happiness. I'm going to talk about the field of positive psychology, which is an identified field of psychology. I'm going to be talking about Martin Seligman, who was one of the people who kind of founded that area of psychology, and some of his theories around helplessness and growth, around some of the advances there have been in thinking about how we think about well-being, the power model itself. But then we're going to do something very different, because normally in these talks, I just give the talk, it lasts about an hour, and then there's some questions and that's it. But seeing we've got more time tonight, what I'm actually going to do is we're going to have a break, and then I'm going to do a practical session with you where we actually look at some of the ideas that come out of positive psychology and start to think about how they might apply to you. It's going to be a kind of paper and pencil exercise. It'll be private because you don't have to, to divulge anything to anybody unless you want to. But we're going to go through some of the exercises that positive psychology recommends in terms of thinking about your happiness and potentially increasing your happiness. So as I say, it's a two-part show tonight. First of all, there'll be the talk, and then after the break, there'll be a more sort of workshoppy type session where you have the opportunity to get engaged in what's going on and think about how some of the ideas actually apply to yourself. I said I don't really like the word happiness in some respects because happiness tends to conjure up this kind of bandwagon idea that, uh, you know, sort of Hare Krishna, everybody's happy, everybody's chanting. And if you look around, there is loads and loads of stuff being produced with the title of happiness. All kinds of books, all kinds of courses being run with the idea of making people happier. And in fact, there's even an International Day of Happiness, but it was on March the 20th, so I'm afraid you missed the chance for this year. <laughs> it's kind of as if you were being asked or invited to join some sort of massive movement that, that was going to create a better world for everybody and, and everybody was going to be joyful and singing and all the rest of it. Uh, and that, I think, is a bit misleading, and so does Mark Seligman, but we'll, we'll come to that. The other thing that's worth saying, which makes me doubt a little bit about the definition of happiness, is that it turns out happiness isn't the same thing all the way across the world. Different cultures have different notions of what happiness actually is. So that, for example, in uh, Eastern cultures, happiness is very often not so much about the individual themselves, 
but it's about how well society's working. The idea of social harmony, being able to join in with people, be part of something that's happening in the community with your neighbours, that sense of belonging, that's regarded as a much higher ideal than personal happiness. The sort of personal happiness idea is very much a Western idea, and some of the work on happiness has previously been criticised for that, but it took account only of one particular culture and one particular approach to happiness. And the other thing is even the expressions of happiness can actually be different across cultures. So in some Eastern cultures, smiling, for example, isn't necessarily always an indication of happiness. It could be an indication of embarrassment. So we have to be a bit careful when we're thinking about what this happiness actually is. But we're going to deal with it tonight mainly in terms of the way in which the Western culture thinks about happiness. But the question then arises, well, OK, I've expressed some doubt. Should we actually take happiness seriously? Well, certainly the government does, uh, because from 2011, the Office of National Statistics has been attempting to measure how happy the population actually is. And this is what they said when they started the exercise. The term well-being is often to mean happiness. Happiness is one aspect of well-being of individuals and can be measured by asking them about their subjective well-being. And so, clearly, the government thinks that happiness is important in some respects. Uh, and these are the questions that we actually ask in England and Wales to try and find out happy, how happy people actually are. So they ask you, overall, how satisfied are you with your life nowadays? And the term after that, hedonic, I'll come to that a little bit more later, but it basically means the instant pleasure, you know, that sort of instant feeling you have of how good things are. Overall, to what extent do you feel the things that you do in your life are worthwhile? And that's eudaimonic, which is a sense of meaning and purpose. It's not just the instant happiness feeling. It's more about whether there's a sense of meaning and purpose about what you're doing in life. Overall, how happy did you feel yesterday? That's an experience measure. And overall, how anxious did you feel yesterday? Another experience measure. So the government of the UK is measuring this in the British Household Survey every year and getting some idea of how happy they think people actually are. And a lot of that was stimulated by this guy, Richard Layard. Richard Layard is an economist, and in the early 2000s, around 2002, he gave a lecture in which he said, happiness is an economic variable. It actually contributes to the wealth and well-being of the country. And he looked at simple things like, for example, the number of people who were on a sickness benefit because of relatively straightforward psychological problems of things like anxiety and depression. And he said, but these people are treatable. You could actually raise that level of happiness. You could raise the, the level out of the depression. You could raise the level out of the anxiety they're experiencing because there are psychological techniques around which enable us to do that sort of thing, mainly, I think, called cognitive behaviour therapy that some of you may have heard of CBT. And he started spouting this to politicians, saying, look, you know, if we actually get these people off benefits, first of all, that's cheaper, that they're more productive, their families are happier, they're happier. It's a win-win scenario. Why wouldn't you do that? And he was very persuasive. Psychologists have been saying that for years, but nobody listens to psychologists. The economist says it, that's quite different, you see. So... <laughs> But given his due, he was successful. His heart's in the right place, I've met him on a number of occasions. And he was saying, you know, that improvement is achievable through individual change, through engaging the public in change, and through political change. And he based a lot of his ideas on what he was hearing about positive psychology that I'm going to talk about more later on. And he founded an organisation called Action for Happiness, which is still... Uh, very alive and doing lots of interesting things, running lots of sessions around the country. There are courses run in Edinburgh by people uh, based on the Action for Happiness model that people can go along to and learn some of the techniques that he was talking about. It led to a lot of other things in the health service, increasing access to psychological therapies, for example, which was a big drive in England, or what was called the Matrix in Scotland, which was actually about making different levels of psychological therapy available to people according to the level of need that they actually had. When Action for Happiness was launched, uh, I'd say I'm sometimes a bit sceptical about happiness, there was a big article in the Psychologist magazine, which is the magazine of the British Psychological Society, but there was some guy called Ray Miller who said, 
while everyone seems to be claiming the right to happiness, I want to defend the right to be bloody miserable. <laughs> uh, and the reason for that, as I was saying there, is that unhappiness is sometimes seen as a disease. Uh, and it's not. Being unhappy is actually a perfectly natural reaction to a lot of things that actually happen in life. Not everything that happens in life is happy. But if people come to believe it's some sort of illness or disease, then they're looking for a cure. They're saying somebody ought to do something about this. It's a natural reaction, and people will always oscillate between being unhappy at times and happier at times. And it's not about creating some universal state uh, of, of this sort of Parakrishna type, you know, where everybody's high all the time on happiness. It's about finding out how to balance that in life so that you're actually able to be content in life. And I prefer the term contentment, uh, and that's what I was saying in that article. So we've looked a bit at what happiness is and isn't. We've looked a bit at how the uh, UK government is, is actually looking at that. The Scottish government also are actually looking at happiness in some detail. Every year they publish a thing called the Scottish Health Survey, and it measures a whole range of things around different aspects of health. But one of the things that it measures is well-being. And it uses the thing called the Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale, which you can see on here. Uh, and it asks 14 questions as opposed to the four that they, the English system asks. Uh, and they're largely sort of practical questions, things like, you know, I've been feeling useful, I've been feeling relaxed, I've been dealing with my problems well, I've been feeling close to other people. Things which are quite practical that people can relate to in many ways. And that's quite interesting because it also suggests the kinds of things that might tend to make people feel happier or, or less happy. I had hoped to give you the 2016 data for this because according to the government website, the 2016 data was to be published in September this year. It wasn't out today, so we've only got a day and a half to do it roughly. But anyway, if you look at that, it shows you how happiness has changed since Scotland started measuring it, which was before England, because England didn't start doing it until 2011, but Scotland actually piloted it in 2006 uh, and actually started measuring it annually from 2008. Uh, and it's a scale that goes from a minimum of 14 to a maximum of 70. This only shows a section of the scale, and that's because, in actual fact, over all these years, it's changed very little. It tends to hover around the 50 mark. Uh, and spikes at small ups and downs, it has stayed around that level. And I'd be interested to see how it has been actually in the last year, 2016. One of the things that's interesting about that is that a lot's happened in the world in the years when that's actually been being measured. If you think about 2008, for example, 2008, that was when the big financial crash happened. And you think, well, oh, maybe that would have a big effect on people's sense of happiness. It turns out it didn't. Uh, and the English data, as a matter of interest, shows very much the same thing when they're actually looking at their measures, that actually happiness tends to be relatively stable, that it's not much affected by the things that are actually going on in the world around it. It's something that seems to be much more personal to people. There are some factors affected. Things like poverty can affect it. Things like really poor health can affect it. But on the whole, people actually have a sort of internal sense of happiness that's moderately independent of a lot of the things that are happening throughout about them. And that's quite interesting because it suggests that actually the source of happiness is you. It's in you. Uh, and that that's something you can actually then work with. Just as a matter of interest, because uh, there was some stuff in the press recently about Edinburgh being the unhappiest city in the UK, I thought I would just have a quick look and see what the data actually said. Uh, and what it actually tells us is that Edinburgh is pretty average. So in terms of life satisfaction, Edinburgh's got a score of 7.61 as opposed to the UK 7.65. And in terms of happiness, it's got a score of 7.41 compared with the UK's average of 7.48. So Edinburgh is a pretty average city in that sense. And the good thing is that Edinburgh did come out as the nicest place in the UK to live a while ago. So feel good for Edinburgh. OK, so mentioned positive psychology a few times. And this brings us on to thinking about what positive psychology actually is. And it was developed by this guy I've been talking about, Mark Seligman, and a colleague of his. There is a wonderful name, which you can possibly see there, called Mihai Chiksen Mihai. 
and believe it or not, there's a website that's dedicated to telling you how to pronounce his name. <laughs> I, I was really stuck for a while. But the, the two of them in 1998 began to develop this idea that there was a different way of looking at a lot of psychology. They were quite critical of the way in which they felt psychology had dealt with problems like well-being and happiness and depression and so on. Because essentially what they were saying was they felt that psychology was only taking an interest from people who were already down and looking at how you brought them back to a level of normality. And they were saying, but actually it should be about more than that. It should be about looking at optimizing people's function, taking them beyond zero, lifting them up to a sort of higher level where they can actually get more out of life. It's not just about curing the damage, as it were. Now, actually, I don't agree with them about that because I've worked as a safe and health service for 35 years as a psychologist. And certainly what drove a lot of my work was actually helping people to optimize their own potential to reach out and become the best that they could be in many respects. But he was principally talking about a lot of American uh, psychology and psychiatry, and perhaps it's slightly more true there, but it's driven a lot by things like tune schemes and so forth. But they were saying that they believed that there was a psychology of positive human functioning which could be discovered and which would be effective in helping people thrive in their individual sense in their families and in their communities in a book called Authentic Happiness. And this is the guy, Mark Seligman, and he actually is the reason why I'm giving this talk tonight, because Alex was saying to me, what are you going to talk about? Would you like to give a talk? Would you like to give another one in the series? And I was thinking, oh, what else shall I do? When I was at the annual conference of the British Psychological Society earlier on this year, and the keynote speaker was Mark Seligman. And I thought, oh, I listened to his talk, and it was really a very interesting talk, and I had the chance to chat to him a bit afterwards about some of the things that he was saying, updating some of his early theories. And I thought, actually, there's a lot in that that perhaps wasn't the very first talk that I gave about happiness, and it would be very interesting to sort of bring people up to date in terms of the ways in which looking at happiness and looking at well-being have developed in the five and a half years since I gave that first talk. Uh, and Mark Seligman has, has made an industry out of this happiness business. He's got uh, various websites, some of which are on here where you can do lots of interesting things. And some of these websites were, were listed on the advertising for the session because I, I sort of uh, suggested some, some places you might look. So he's got various websites and a thing called the Perma Model, which is what we're going to talk about mainly tonight. I don't know if any of you here have got psychological background. Has anybody got a psychological background? No? Who's mm -hmm. Oh, one. Right. Thank goodness for that. <laughs> well, for the rest of you, uh, one of the things that Mark Seligman was doing before, before he knew about, uh, before he knew about uh, happiness was a thing called uh, helplessness. Uh, and this was quite an interesting idea. It was something that came out of some experiments that they did where they were looking at dogs and electric shocks. Uh, and what they discovered was that normally if you give a dog an electric shock and there's somewhere it can jump to get away from the electric shock, it pretty quickly learns to jump. What they did was that they rigged up the system so that when the electric shock happened, the dog couldn't initially jump, so there was no way it could escape the shock. And then after a period of time, it reintroduced the notion that it could escape, but the dog didn't even try. It had basically learned, there was nothing I can do in this situation, therefore I cannot escape the shock, therefore I will do nothing. And his notion was that this was a learned thing, that, that the dog had learned that nothing it did actually made any difference, and therefore it wasn't going to make the attempt. And there was a sort of parallel in terms of human experiences in various ways. So this is suggesting a young guy who's not been very good at maths, keeps making mistakes, keeps getting the answers wrong, and thinks, that's it, no matter what I do, I'm never going to be any good at maths, I'll never try. One of the things that Mark Seligman was saying in his recent talks is that learned helplessness was wrong. That in fact, helplessness is the default state, that that is what people actually start off with. It's not something they have to learn, that the natural state of people is to assume that they can't do things. But like this, what if I failed? I'm going to stay right here where I'm safe and sound and do nothing. And he was saying that actually, 
his original theory that, that the, the helplessness was learned was wrong. That's the default state. And what we've actually got to learn is learnability. We have to learn that we can do things, and that overcomes that state of learned helplessness. And that ties in very much with a number of things around positive psychology and where this idea of looking at what you can do, how you can build on what you've built, how you can grow and develop is actually very important. And it ties in with another person who has been writing a lot in psychology in recent years, a woman called Carol Gwen. And she's been talking mainly about the educational scenario because she was very interested in how children learn. And she suggested that there were two different mindsets that tended to characterize people when they were learning. There was a fixed mindset where people believed that how they did today was the determining factor in how they were always going to do. If I didn't do something well today, well, I'm never going to be able to do it. Uh, if I failed at something today, well, that's it. I'm never going to be able to succeed in doing that. But, but like the guy was just saying about his maths in the previous slide. And she showed that Children who think like that don't tend to make progress because if they actually have a failure in something, that's it. They stop trying. They stop actually making the effort. The other kind of mindset is what she called the growth mindset. And that is the notion, well, okay, I failed today, but if I work hard, I can probably do better tomorrow. I failed today or that didn't go too well, but I learned some things in doing that. And the things I learned will actually help me to make a better attempt in the future. Maybe I can try a bit harder and do something that will be more likely to succeed. Maybe actually these things which other people might see as failures are challenges that actually allow me to, to think about how I'm going to grow and develop and that my effort and attitudes are the thing that's actually going to determine my abilities. I don't have a fixed ceiling that's going to stop me doing things if I'm really making the attempt. And again, this links in very much with the kinds of things that Seligman and positive psychology are saying that people should not be limited by the challenges that they face or the failures that occur or the difficulties that they have. They should be encouraged to see that these are things which help them to think differently about the experience that they're having and find opportunities to, to actually move forward. So, let's hear from Mark Sullivan himself. Many of us believe that a, a good way of looking at what's north of zero, north of indifference, has five different elements. And the first one is, is uh, what I, whenever I talk to press, I say, please don't put the smiley face on the cover. I was delighted that the advertiser today did not put the smiley face uh, on it. But it is the question of positive emotion and uh, uh, happiness, rapture, comfort, joy. And I'm very interested in those things, the question of how to measure them and how to build it. But positive psychology doesn't end there. The, the second ingredient of positive psychology is uh, engagement, flow, being one with the music. So the house lights are up enough so I can see the first dozen rows. And it looks to me that about 70% hmm, of you uh, are one with music that you're uh, uh, wrapped up listening in what I'm saying. The other thirty percent of you are having sexual fantasies. <laughs> we'll rock in a minute. So uh, we're interested in the question of uh, uh, measuring flow, measuring engagement, and how in schools, in the workplace, in your love relationships, and what you care about, you could have more of that. So we'll talk about that. Uh, the third element of well-being, to my way of thinking, is positive relationships. Uh, and the question, can you have better relationships than you do now? And it turns out there have been a couple of discoveries, one of which I think will surprise you, and techniques that children, people in corporations uh, can learn. So uh, we'll talk about the R relationships. The, the fourth element, and, and notice these are different from smiley face elements, is uh, meaning and purpose in life. And for me, uh, that's uh, belonging to and serving something you think is bigger than you are. 
and uh, I'll tell you something about uh, research on this and uh, the question of can, can one have more meaning and purpose in life? And the fifth uh, element, yay, is accomplishment. Uh, so, uh, PERMA is the uh, acronym for this. Uh, and uh, the uh, two important things about PERMA, uh, if I was giving this talk 20 years ago, and I'm going to suggest toward the end that the measurement of PERMA is a good state and national goal. If I suggested that 20 years ago, people would have said, well, dollars are measurable, but well-being is not. So it turns out each of these things is measurable. Uh, I have a website that's free. It's called Authentic Happiness, one word, dot org. And it talks about, it, it has on it the 20 leading tests of these variables of well-being. And you want, they're free. You can take them. Uh, if you want to know, um, about two and a half million people have registered at the website and taken it. So if you actually want to know what your sense of humor is relative to other Australians, that you can find out actually, so the percentiles about this. And then the, the dieting question occurs. Um, it turns out each of these things is buildable. And part of the reason I never worked, I, I spent my life working on misery, uh, trauma, helplessness, depression, suicide. And part of the reason I didn't work on well being is there was a study about 35 years ago which looked at lottery winners in Illinois, and it basically measured the smile effects, how happy they were, and it followed them. It turns out when you win the lottery, you get happier, but about three months later, you're back to the your usual promotion itself. And so I said, well, I didn't want to work on anything as uh, transient as that. But it turns out that's not representative of this. And positive emotion, engagement, relationships, meaning, and accomplishment are probably buildable in lasting ways. Uh, okay, so that, that's just a little bit of Mark's home, introducing the idea, he was talking to an Australian audience there, as you probably gathered, introducing some of the things that made him start to think differently about the way in which we could actually be approaching happiness and well-being, the PERMA model, and as he said, that's positive emotions, engagement, positive relationships, meaning and accomplishment, and the word which he used towards the beginning there was the word flourish. That he was not interested in just raising people up to not being miserable, as he said. He was interested in what actually helps people to flourish, what helps them to go among zero in that way. And that's what we're going to be looking at. He sometimes talks about there being three lifestyles. There's the kind of pleasant life, which is the sort of, uh, you know, everything's fine, I'm feeling good today. There's the good life, which is a little bit more long term, looking at things like contentment, looking at things like your overall view of living, and what's called sometimes the meaningful life. Uh, and these are all tied together in that model that he was introducing, the Perma model, and he's saying that really, in a sense, what we want is not just one of these, we want all three of these. Very often, people are aiming particularly at the pleasant life, what feels good right now. But actually, there's a lot more to happiness and well-being than just that sort of set of instant feelings. So he's saying the pleasant life, well, that's fine. That's the kind of quick hit that people get. People are seeking things like peak emotions. They seek pleasure. They seek rapture. They seek ecstasy. They seek a sense of warmth or comfort or attention. That's a sort of quick hit in terms of emotion. I feel really a bit high. That's fine. They tend to look for that in things like about money they have, being able to go shopping, whether they get social media likes on Facebook, thrills and spills, whether they can afford the new iPhone 10, thousand quid, I don't think I'll be affording one. And as you said, there are things like winning the lottery, that you know, people think, oh, if only I won the lottery, I would be really happy. People tend to concentrate on things like being in the fashion, things like their body image, things like diets, all that kind of stuff. What uh, Sullivan would say is all these things are things. They're not actually thoughts. They're not something that's deeply inside the past. They're, they're just things that have to be passing through your life. And he talked there about the lottery winners who after three months, even if they won a lot of money, their happiness initially would go up, but then it would revert to a much more 
standard level that they previously had before. So this pleasant life, well, it's fine for the time that it lasts, but it tends to be ephemeral. It doesn't actually change your overall sense of, of well-being in the longer term more substantially. So this was where his power model comes in, looking at the things that might actually do a better long-term job. So he's saying it's more than just the absence of misery, but some of the definitions we have of happiness are unrealistic. So sometimes people believe that you, know, you should be able to be happy all the time. The unhappiness, we've already said, is a mental illness. Sometimes people think of it that way. There's this hedonic depressive cycle. He was talking about the lottery there, but what happens is you know you get the quick hit from the hedonic pleasant lifestyle, but then that disappears. And when it disappears, people actually tend often to be more depressed because what they thought was going to make them happy hasn't made them happy. So they go out looking for the next hit. And that lifts them a bit again, and then that wears off, and they're back to things like being more depressed again, a sort of hedonic depressive cycle. People feel they have a right to be happy, and I said earlier on, I don't think people do have a right to be happy. I think sometimes people have a right to be miserable, because some things in life are miserable. And if you couldn't actually feel miserable, that would be something to be miserable about. You, you've got to actually be able to experience the full range of emotions, so there's no right to be happy all the time, and life's certainly not going to be like that. But we see that belief reflected in basic things around healthcare. Despite years of trying to cut down the number of antidepressants that are prescribed in Scotland and in the UK, it's government policy to reduce the prescription of antidepressants, we find that, in fact, they've gone up, and that we have one in six adults using antidepressants. Now, some people really need antidepressants. I'm not really going to argue about that at all. I mean, I have seen some really bad depressive cases in, in my clinical work, and they absolutely needed all the help they could get in whatever form which is available, including medication. But a lot of the people who are actually uh, getting these antidepressants are what are referred to as mild to moderate depressive cases or mild to moderate anxiety cases. And it's not absolutely clear that that's a clinical illness, that it's a reaction to life events very often. But people say, oh, I shouldn't be feeling like that, so the doctor better prescribe me something, and that will help me to feel better. And that has a vicious circle effect as well, because, of course, taking the tablet doesn't cure the problem that actually was there to start with. And if you try and take the tablet away again at the end of the day, then people simply revert to where they were before. Actually, being unhappy is a positive thing because what unhappiness often tells you is you've got to change something. Something has to change. You've got to change your attitude, change your approach, change what you're doing. And that's what the unhappiness is basically saying. Time to change. And that change will be much more effective at the end of the day than the loss of the taking of medication. Uh, and as, uh, as Martin Salmon said, you know, it's, it's actually not just about getting back to zero, getting back to the OK level. It's actually about seeing the opportunity to increase your sense of enjoyment of life, increase your sense of well-being, what he called climbing above zero, aiming higher. So it's not just about relief from misery. It's about actually aiming for something rather better and rather higher. So the first of his PERMA was positive emotions. And a lot of that is about acknowledging that Many good things happen in life. And when we get to the second part of tonight's exercise, we'll be looking at some of the ways in which we begin to recognize that. But partly it's about appreciating the positive things that happen every day, not just looking at the negative things. A sort of realistic optimism rather than pessimism. I say realistic optimism because, you know, life doesn't always go smoothly. And sometimes, you know, things are going to go wrong. But that doesn't mean that you should look at everything as if it was going to go wrong to start with and believe that that was the case. A willingness to learn what we called earlier on the growth model, this notion that there are lots of opportunities to improve who you are, how you are, what you're doing. Planning for success, a sense of self-determination. You know, the answer to a lot of these problems is not always something out there. It's very often something that you can actually influence yourself in many respects. And again, I'm not saying you can overcome every problem. I'm not saying that you know, nothing is, is uh, actually an external cause of unhappiness in some cases. Sometimes that will be true. But again, a lot of it is sometimes about how we react to these circumstances, a sense of self-confidence, sense of resilience. 
and a sense of gratitude for the things that actually go well. So he's saying there are a number of positive emotions that you can actually develop, which will help in terms of the, the happiness and well-being. Then we come back to this guy, Mihai Chichen Mihai. He wrote a national bestseller called Flow. And what he was talking about was a sort of optimal psychological state where you become totally engaged in, totally focused in what you're doing for its own sake, that you, you're in the present moment. It has some links to things that people might be more familiar with, like the mindfulness movement, which has a similar kind of thing about being in the present moment, being totally engaged, being totally aware at that particular time, in that particular situation. And it's been shown that that sort of sense of flow and engagement has been associated with lots of positive experiences and it's something that's been looked at a lot in industry and in the working environment, because it turns out that if people feel fully engaged in what they're actually doing, feel that what they're doing is kind of worthwhile, uh, then they actually they perform better. There are actually better performance outcomes. Uh, and during flow, people tend to become less aware of things like time, they become less aware of themselves, they're less self-conscious. Uh, and they're actually directing their whole sense of being and purpose to the things that they're actually doing. And there are many, many things that we're doing that, that, that you can actually do that with. Well, my wife, who knows that I'm going to talk about occasionally in the front row, you know, she's recently taken up gardening. <laughs> and, and she has become absolutely dedicated. I hardly see her sometimes these days, but she's out planting plants or cutting the grass or whatever. And that may seem relatively trivial in some respects, but it's an example of how she has become engaged with a sense of flow about, I want to have a nice garden, I want to have nice flowers, and she devotes her time and her effort to that. Lots of other things are obviously more serious and more complicated than that, but that's, that's just a little example in terms of engagement and flow. So that's about not just the sort of pleasant life, but the good life, the sense that, you know, that, that there's something you're doing that is actually achieving something. Uh, and when Mihai Chisa Mihai was talking about flow, he was saying there's, there's a kind of balance here that, that uh, it's about matching the skills that you have to the tasks that you're actually trying to do. And then there's an optimum level at which the, the task actually fully engages your skills or even develops your skills a little bit. And when you're in that channel, that's the flow channel. If things are too easy, you tend to become bored, not really engaged. If things are really far too difficult, then there's a tendency become anxious and you don't perform well there either. So he's saying there's a kind of balance there in terms of the challenge skill balance, that the clear goals that you have to have, very often in a business setting, it's about things too like getting clear feedback about how well you're doing so that you know actually whether you're achieving what you're supposed to be doing. That sense of total concentration, a sense that you're in control, a loss of self-consciousness, uh, and what's sometimes called an autotelic experience. That means that you're doing it for its own sake. There comes a point when you're not doing it because somebody else has told you to do it. You're doing it because it's what you really, really want to do. And you've got that feeling of being totally engaged in that, that action. So that, that's the engagement bit. Relationships, well, they turn out to be very important in lots of ways. That There's lots of stuff, for example, showing that good relationships are good for your health. But he's saying it's actually good for your mental health, particularly. It's good for that sense of well-being. And these good supportive relationships can come in a number of ways. They can be things like your partner, just talking about my wife there. It can be family generally. It can be engaged with your family. They can be a sense of, sort of positive relationship and support. It can be friendships. It can be teamwork at work. It can be social engagement, the things that you do outside the house, outside your own day-to-day -day life. Uh, people that you meet, people that you're involved with, getting involved in something like charity work, whatever, supporting others is a very important part of that sort of sense of feeling a relationship, not just with those immediately around you, but also extending that a little bit to the people with whom you're likely to engage <coughs> in other aspects of your life. And it's been shown over and over again that these sorts of positive relationships have a really uh, beneficial effect, both in terms of physical health and in terms of mental health. One of the things with which uh, Sullivan talked about when he was giving the lecture that I was at down in, London, down in England in May in Brighton was he was saying that sometimes we actually underestimate how important that is. And he was using an example. 
So sometimes, you know, the way in which we actually react and reinforce relationships isn't as powerful as we think it is. And he was talking about active, constructive, destructive, and passive ways of responding in sort of uh, constructive squares here. So say, supposing, for example, your partner comes in and says, I've just been promoted at work. He said, well, what I would do, probably what I would have done in the past, and what a lot of people would do, is to say something like, hey, that's really great. Let's have some champagne and celebrate. And that sounds fairly good. On the other hand, there is the passive destructive, where, say, did you remember to get some milk in the way? <laughs> what Sullivan was saying was, if we want to actually build relationships, and this is where he's saying, you know, a lot of these things are learnable, you can actually start to think about them and actually do them better, is this, that what you should really be saying to the person is, wow, that's really good, you put a lot of work into that, you must be really glad that that work has paid off, You've got some recognition there. How did it feel when the person told you that you actually got that promotion? How did it feel in that moment where you realized that it all come together and you really succeeded? And he's saying that's the act of constructive, that you're encouraging the person to actually relive the experience in a positive way. And what he says is that that actually does an awful lot in terms of actually building relationships. So that's, that's a particular example. But just thinking about that, you're almost sort of putting yourself into the other person's shoes and thinking, how did it feel for them? How did they experience it? How are they feeling about what's actually happened? And of course, there's the active destructive thing. That probably means we're going to have to cancel the holiday. Then. <laughs> <laughs> so we want to avoid that one. Anyway, we come to the, the, the M, which is, is meaning and purpose. Uh, and you know, the question is, what gives life meaning? A lot of people assume that you're know, some sort of external source of meaning. I, I tend to believe what this guy is saying here. The meaning of life is to give life a meaning. The meaning of life is very much what you create in terms of a meaning for what you do and how you do it. Uh, so there are some things that certainly help you to engage with that. And Sullivan talked about the sense of belonging to or being part of something that's bigger than the present self, something that has more value, more meaning and purpose than the self. Uh, and it could be found in things like the beliefs that people have, ideas of ethics, humanism, religion in some respects, political views, being green, uh, believing the, the, the nature of the family and supporting your family. All these kinds of things might be things which provide a sense of meaning and purpose, which is more than just about looking after oneself. It's also about feeling that you're using your strengths to achieve something that's bigger than just looking after yourself, using your abilities, using your skills to a greater purpose on some sort of level. And this word eudaimonic comes in again. This is the notion that some happiness comes from the sense that you're doing something that's worthwhile, that it has a purpose and it has meaning and that it's worth doing, and that that in itself gives you that sense of, of, of lift in many respects. So that's meaning and purpose. And then we come to accomplishment. Uh, and some of you may have heard of Maslow's hierarchy of human needs, which is, I think, it's been talked about in psychology for a long time. The notion that there are various levels of need that people might have, and that uh, that starts off with books. Oh, dear me, what happened there? Obviously, press the wrong button somewhere. Um, right. But uh, you know, there are some needs that are very, very basic. So you've got some sort of physiological needs at the bottom level, and that's sort of the notion that people basically need to be able to eat, uh, they need to be able to drink. If they don't have these basic things in life, then obviously you're going to die. Beyond that, there's things like safety, feeling secure, loving and belonging sense of uh, esteem, the emotion of people sort of value in some way, but the top of the hierarchy is what was referred to as self-actualization. So that's the notion that you know, you're actually achieving something, you're actually growing and developing as an individual, as a person, that there's development occurring, that you're becoming the best that you can be, and that's the phrase I tend to use quite a lot with people, you know, being the best that you can be, ultimately, 
that is the evil one. You don't want to be just average and just close by. There's this notion here, you know, there is skills and abilities that you have, there are attitudes that you have. You want to be using these to achieve the best possible outcome for yourself and for those around about you. And that's what was referred to as self-actualization. And that very much comes under this notion. And one of the things, or two of the things that, that uh, Sullivan was saying, the importance to achieving that sense of accomplishment or a sense of self-discipline, a sense of grit or perseverance, and was uh, actually in a book published called Grit, which goes on at some length about that. Okay, so I'm going to finish off this section with another short video clip, and then we'll have a break. But this is Jeremy Paxman interviewing Martin Sullivan in 2011. And it's interesting just to hear some of the things that Mark Sullivan was saying there. Um, it's the list that includes the Hammersmith Palais and the Bolshoi Ballet, goes on to the Caracuse Porridge, Yellow Socks, Keys and Pickle, and the Top of the Claret, and the Rock Lizard among you will already have figured out I've talked about Ian Dury's reasons to be cheerful. But staying happy is now not just about what you can do for yourself, but what the government might be able to do for you. One of the top theorists of well being, the American psychologist Martin Seligman, is in London telling anyone who will listen how to go about it. <coughs> what makes you happy? Yeah. In 2002, Professor Martin Seligman's theory, Authentic Happiness, laid out a way of storing the happiness of individuals. His work spawned the phrase positive psychology and prompted shelves full of self help books. And, in the professor's view, an overemphasis on cheeriness. So, a revised theory which distills down to the acronym PERMA, experiencing positive emotions, being aware of feelings as they happen, relating to others well, finding meaning in your life, and getting a sense of achievement. He's already inspired David Cameron to announce last year that there'll be a move to try to measure our gross national happiness. If your goal in politics is to help make a better life for people, which mine is, and if you know, both in your gut and by a huge body of evidence, that prosperity alone is only a better then you have to take practical steps to make sure government is properly focused on our quality of life as well as economic growth. Uh, this is all sounding a little high in the sky and woolly, rest assured, the Office of National Statistics is currently phoning 200,000 households to try to measure how happy we are. But at the time of cuts in public spending and demonstrations on the streets, it's an interesting era in which to do it. And Professor Seligman is uh, here now. Um, can you really make people feel well at a time like this? Well, yes, I actually think you can. The question is, how's life going for you? How's life going for the nation? Traditionally, we've measured the economics of it. But what we want to know about in addition is how much positive emotion we have, how good are our relationships, how engaged can we have work with the people we love, how much meaning we have. What are measurable? Are you a naturally cheery chap? No, of course. Quite the opposite. I'm a uh, born pessimist and depressive, actually. I think only a, a pessimist can do serious science on optimism and cheerfulness. Yes, yeah, doesn't that make you wonder whether it's really worth aiming for? Uh, yes, I think it's a very good question. And, and the issue is is there something over and above getting rid of misery? So, all the hope of public policy, therapy is aimed at getting rid of misery. The question is what's above zero? And what is what the of psychology is about? Okay, well being. Yes, so, yes, so beauty is not just the absence of ugliness, uh, bravery is not just the absence of cowardice, and well-being is not just the absence of misery, it's the presence of real things. But isn't it an immensely selfish preoccupation? Well, not quite. Actually, the single, uh, if, if you're depressed right now, and you ask me what's the single most mood-lifting thing you can do, which is go out and help another person. Turns out the way our hedonic system is built, doing something for another person, probably the single biggest boost. 
So all our viewers uh, sitting at home tonight, how do they give them one piece of advice about improving their sense of well-being? Uh, one, one, there are quite a number of pieces, but one easy piece, when we have people every night before they go to sleep, write down two things that went well today and why they went well. It's a big thing, and six months later, in random assignment placebo control tests, people do this uh, happier, higher left, life satisfaction, lower depression, being conscious of the things that go well in your life. But uh, the thing I liked actually of yours, what's, what would your grandchildren say about you? Is that what you write? Well, what, what, what interesting question, how can you have more meaning in life? And one thing we do is we have people write first their vision of what a positive human future will be, and then write their obituary to their grandchildren's eyes, in which they say, what I did to contribute to a positive human future builds meaning and purpose in life. And, and how is David Cameron supposed to apply this, you think? Well, I think the first question is we don't measure the right thing, we don't do the right thing. And all we measure is money. And so the question is first, measuring well-being. Well, it turns out over the last decade, people have found ways of measuring pretty much as well as we can measure schizophrenia or alcoholism, meaning in life, positive emotion, engagement, work, relations with others. So the first thing is to measure the well-being of British people. And then, and I think this is quite bold for the Prime Minister, to hold oneself accountable for changes in well-being by public policy. And give us an example. Well, one thing I work on is uh, schools and school systems, actually in Britain as well as Australia and the United States. So what we do is we take teachers and we teach them the skills of well-being in their own life and never teach it to 10 to 12 year old children and then what we do is we follow the children through puberty and what we find is when teachers learn the skills of well-being for the next couple of years children have less depression less anxiety and better conduct so that's an example of a, a public policy in education that leads to greater well-being. And if I would say to you that a pig lying around in mud is content, what would you say? Well, I'm not really after contentment. So I think contentment and the smiley face are not the variables of real psychological interest. They are things like how engaged you will work, how good are your relations, how much meaning do you have in life. Pig lying around in mud doesn't have enough meaning in life. And do you believe you can give people meaning? Yes, it, it turns out that uh, unlike smart, the smiley face, which is highly heritable, your parents uh, pass it on to you, meaning in life is everyone's birthright, and it's learnable, and uh, it's teachable by the teachers to children, it's teachable in the United States Army. Thank you. Okay, so that was Dr. Jeff Cameron. A lot of things you can say there, and some of the things I've been talking about earlier, we're going to follow up on very much in the second part of tonight, where we're going to go through some exercises, including a couple of ones that you actually mentioned there, to, to see how you might apply that to yourself, how you might actually think about improving your own happiness, your own sense of well-being. It's a uh, thing for which you might need some paper and pencil, so I'm going to leave some paper off the back, and I've got a box of pens here somewhere as well. Which I'll leave off the back. Uh, so when you come back after the break, if you pick up some paper or a pen, uh, then that will be set up for the exercise. And say nothing too arduous, uh, really just a way of putting down a bunch of paper sometimes you have thoughts. Uh, and we may have a chance to discuss some of that a little bit. But a practical exercise for you to think about how you can actually improve your happiness. It's based on a course which actually I ran some years ago where we had a five-week course for a number of people looking at these different elements and each week they would concentrate on one. You're getting all five tonight, so it's the sort of extra special version of everything in one go. Uh, but we'll, we'll look at that after the break. So do enjoy the break. I think we'll be food for the break. The, uh, how long do you think for, for the break then? Well, you can have as long as you like. I mean, uh, basically we've got to finish by half nine, haven't we? Uh, half nine, but we're not chucked out of the building. Uh, so, yeah. well, I reckon people have probably got half an hour. So, okay. So, what time? Uh, Twenty past eight. Twenty past eight. Okay. <laughs> so, come back for twenty past eight. And before you all disappear, um, I just I'm really uh, uh, humbled 
to have received a gift of £50 for the project. And it makes me very happy to be able to pass that on. So I'm going to go up to the bar and I'm going to put that £50 behind the tilt. And uh, for as long as it lasts, uh, the drinks are on Graham Sturrock, who is very generously always supporting this project. This is a voluntary project. Uh, everything that happens, happens by the generosity of, of individuals like Ray and yourselves bringing biscuits and company. Uh, and uh, there's no, no funding. This is just about people meeting. Um, and to give you a sense of what's happening tomorrow night and uh, in, in a theme that's running over the Scottish Mental Health and Arts Film Festival, um, there's the Mad World Art Exhibition is opening in St. Margaret's House. Now, this is celebrating 30 years of Asylum Magazine for Democratic Psychiatry. There are going to be four micro-talks, small talks, tomorrow night with nibbles and an art gallery full of stuff. You're all welcome. Uh, you can find all those details on, on the website. This is about um, opening questions and finding out perspectives on uh, madness. Uh, Asylum Magazine for Democratic Psychiatry has always been an open forum for people. Uh, so there's a big retrospective. You can see all of that. And there's an academic library that's being threaded with lots of different people's artwork. So I, I won't blather on. Uh, I, I will say thank you very much, Ray. And went fast,